Chapter 7, Part 2, Hammering Out a Federal Republic. Okay, so we talked about the era of revolution, of course, all inspired by the American Revolution, the French Revolution, and the successful Haitian Revolution, the only successful slave rebellion uh, uh, in history. Okay, so, so the American government's a, a huge uh, deal to people around the world. And the American ideal, and this had been proven by their victory in their own revolution, the American Revolution. And, of course, the style in which they invented their own their new government was was very uh, interesting to people. OK. OK. We talked about Jefferson. He became the third president in 1800. Who was his vice president? Aaron Burr. Aaron Burr came in second. This is right before that amendment. OK. So just little sidebars. Anyone know uh, what Aaron Burr is famous for besides being the Jefferson's vice president? Actually, Aaron Burr and, and Alexander Hamilton were were uh, you know uh, somewhat in conflict, also not very friendly. Uh, in those days, it was about honor and if you, insulting people. It might lead to a duel. So Hamilton was doing a lot of writing in those days, Federalist Papers, and so on. And he would he was you know highly published and in 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 newspapers you know uh, all the time, and in one of his uh, articles he insulted Aaron Burr, and Aaron Burr took this personally and called him out and and they had a duel, so so a duel in those days of course would be where two men would would you know walk apart from each other turn around and fire each other so they have the duel and Burr killed Hamilton. So the, these two people, Hamilton and Jefferson, we talked about the first part of the chapter, Federalists versus the Anti-Federalists and all of that, comes to a shocking end. You know, the, the, the power and importance of these two men comes to this end when Hamilton is, is killed in 1804, okay? But let's go back to Jefferson. Jefferson's elected president in 1800, and he, uh, he has plans for the nation that included Western expansion, okay? So he decides that it'd be nice if the United States could purchase New Orleans from the French and Napoleon, okay? Uh, so we talked about Napoleon briefly, but this, this is the part where he, again, is part of United States history. So Jefferson sent a representative of the United States government to negotiate with the French and Napoleon to purchase the city of New Orleans, why would they want to do that? Well, pretty clearly, it's it's if you if you if you uh, have New Orleans and you control it, you control the mouth of the Mississippi River coming and going, right? So that's that's a pretty powerful position to have. So Jefferson tells his representative that you have between two uh, two and ten million dollars to offer Napoleon, okay? So that when the person is when the representative is negotiating with Napoleon, surprisingly. Napoleon offered much more. The truth is, Napoleon was militarily overextended. Uh, he needed money to continue his war against Britain, what would become known as the Napoleonic Wars, and also how to deal with the Haitian Revolution, how to deal with the, the fact that this, this very wealthy island suddenly broke away from your control. Uh, okay, so he also knew that you know, I, I can't really force the Americans out of the land that the, the, that the French had possessed earlier in North America before the French and Indian War. So he didn't have a, a huge power, you know, a, a position of power to negotiate. So he offered much, much more to the surprise of their representative, and he offered all of this land. So if you look at this map, of course, New Orleans is a city down here. That's all it is. But but Napoleon says you can have all of this. So this is a big deal. Jefferson thinks, my gosh, we can double the size of our country in one fell swoop, just like that. This is kind of a big deal. But he offered all of it for $15 million. That's five more than what they were supposed to spend. But, of course, you're getting so much more. You're getting an incredible amount more. It might be worth the extra $5 million. So this includes 827,000 square miles of land west of the Mississippi, a massive territory stretch um, from the Mississippi River, massive territory stretch from the Mississippi River to the Rocky Mountains, uh, all across the Great Plains. This more than doubled the size of the United States, and it worked out to be about four cents per acre. 
Uh, and this deal was done in ap April of 1803, but it brought a good deal of controversy. Uh, uh, although American development depended on Western expansion and everyone knew we got to move to the West, more lands, more opportunities. It also raised controversial issues that, that almost led to the disunion of the United States many, many years before the Civil War would actually do that. Some of, some of the Federalists up in New England, so up here, the Federalists, the old school Federalists up here, they're concerned about adding all this land because at some point you're going to chop that up into states, right? You're going to do this. You're going to create, and, th and this, is, this is really where all, all these states came from, from Louisiana, uh, all of Montana, the, the Dakotas, Minnesota, Colorado, all these states came from the Louisiana Purchase. So the, the, uh, the, the government officials in New England, with their kind of power base, they, they realized that with all these states comes representation. You, you're going to have two senators from each state. You're going to have representatives. So the House is going to have a whole lot more people in it. This is going to shift the balance of power to away from us and our small contingency up here, while while very populated, not very big, to, to these people. So they're they're very worried about this. And they threaten to secede from the Union. So in the midst of buying this land in this great moment for the United States, doubling the size of your of your country, people people are against it. Okay. And they felt that their political power in New England would be would be dramatically reduced by this purchase. Okay. But they also claimed that Jefferson had not followed his own strict interpretation of the Constitution. So if you remember back to the comparison of Jefferson and Hamilton, Jefferson saw the Constitution as to, as to be followed strictly, word for word. So the Federalists claimed the Constitution did not permit the federal government to purchase new land. It doesn't say in the Constitution anywhere you can do that. Okay, So Jefferson's kind of up against the wall a little bit. And he was troubled by the inconsistency also. He didn't like it. But in the end, he decided that the Constitution's treaty-making provisions allowed him to act, and that's that's how he justified it, okay? So most of the Senate agreed, and the Louisiana Purchase easily passed 26 to 6. But the, this, this dramatic expansion also contradicted Jefferson's commitment to reduce the national debt as swiftly as possible. Remember, he wanted to pay it off. Hamilton wanted to keep it for credit. So, of course, people, his detractors say, how, how do you expect to pay out the national debt when now we're going to buy land for $15 million? It's going to put us more in a debt. Of course, the argument was made. It's, it's a small sum for such a large amount of land. This is kind of a, uh, you know, a, a uh, opportunity here, a windfall profit. Okay, this is something that you, we didn't expect. Uh but still, it's an enormous price tag for the modest federal budget of the day, okay? But Jefferson pushes it through, and in this, this, this land uh, purchase passes. So the Louisiana Purchase highlighted Jefferson's ability to make practical political decisions, although contrary to some of his central principles, okay? This is what a president has to do sometime. Um, so... Of course, this, this purchase proves and guarantees that Western expansion was so important to Jefferson's overall vision. So he took bold action, and the gains were dramatic. And you see the, the image here. Uh, the territory acquired would in time add 13 new states to the Union. Okay, uh, That would happen over time, not right away. Okay, so you just bought this land, what now? No no white European individual knew much about these lands. They were mysterious. It, it wasn't the land of the white man. This, this, is the, this is the Native American land that nobody had really uh, explored or, or, or looked at, okay? Uh, so Jefferson commissioned the Lewis and Clark expedition in 1803 to explore this Northwest Territory. But interestingly, and, and kind of, uh, you know, proving his foresight and his, his ability to see in the future or, or to plan ahead, see three, four steps ahead, he also told them, look for a, a route that we could potentially build a transcontinental railroad one day. So even in 1803, Jefferson's thinking about connecting east to west by railroad. This is, of course, 65 or so years before it actually happened. So... Again, proving proving the man's intellect, very very bright individual. Okay, okay, 1804, about 45 men headed by Meriwether Lewis and William Clark 
they come to uh, St. Louis and they move up the Missouri River and they start to go into lands that had never been, been seen before. They cross the Rocky Mountains and come to uh, the Columbia River in what would be the present uh, day area of Portland, Oregon. Okay. Uh, they reach the Pacific Ocean by November of 1805. And of course, this journey, they, they, they learn important information on native people of the area, uh, plants and animals, geography. They, they, they map it. They, they find it's, it's never been seen before by white men. So, so now we have a general idea of what's going on. Of course, they didn't, they didn't look at all in the, in the, in the middle here. And they, they tended to go north. But, but this, this was a big expedition and these men were considered to be heroes and returned uh you know back in 1806 came got back to st louis again and returned with great fanfare this this these were these were you know adventurous explorers and of course everybody like likes that idea okay okay uh the next issue or next incident we're going to talk about here is the war of 1812 okay uh <clears throat> Many people call it the second war for American independence because you're fighting the British again. Uh, so this is an armed conflict between the United States and the British Empire. So they had the revolution. What would that be? 30, 40 something years earlier. And you won. America, the American colonies won, beat the British. They became independent. Britain was still smarting from this. They didn't like this. This, this, this embarrassed them internationally. Okay. So along comes this opportunity to fight again, and Britain's all for it. And of course, if they defeat the, the Americans, they're going to get their colonies back. And they don't mind that idea at all, at all okay? So, so, part of, so for the Americans, part of, the, of their strategy in this war was to prove their independence from the British Empire once and for all, okay? So what, was the, what were the conflicts that led to this, this battle, this war, uh, the, the British had been restricting American trade because they feared it was harmful for their war with France. Of course, Britain and France are fighting each other, kind of the way it was back then. Britain and France were always at each other's throats. But Britain thought the, you know, the United, the, this new United States is friendly with France. They helped them beat them. Uh, so they're going to be sending them supplies. So American trade was restricted by, by the British, okay? Uh, and this was, you know, this is kind of part of the uh, the British's plan. They're, they're they're trying to get back into the New World, back to what became the United States or even west of there. They're still angry about losing the Revolution. They had a plan to set up an Indian state in the Midwest uh, in in order to maintain their influence in the region. And during this war, ten thousand Native Americans fought on the side of the British in this war. Uh, also, Canada was a British colony that also allied with the British. So think about that. We talked about how the Native Americans didn't didn't like the British at all. They hated them. And they, they went with the French. Well, the French were defeated in the French Indian War. And then they, you know, okay, we, and then there was a revolution and the, and the English were defeated. Now, now the, the Native Americans don't like the colonists, the new Americans, because they're the ones that are moving west. So now they're going to go on the side of the British. So this is history. This is this is the way history develops sometimes. And okay, so of course the Americans objected to the British restricting their trade, and what they objected to was the idea called impressment, British impressment, where you impress somebody or literally kidnap somebody. Uh, and what, what I'm talking about here is where the British Navy would pull up, pull up to a ship, board it, and snatch many of the sailors that were serving to, to serve on British ships. And this was happening to American ships. So the impressment of American sailors into the Royal Navy, this was an, a most important for many Americans and made them angry that, that you're kidnapping our own, our own men to, to, to fight in your war. Okay. So under British law, the Navy had the right during the time of war to, to do this, to sweep through the streets of Great Britain, and essentially arresting men and placing them in the Royal Navy, going through the bars and grabbing men and just arrest them and put them in the Navy because you needed men. So impressment cutter ships would, would patrol the harbor and coastal areas, searching for ships returning from voyages with men who might be pressed into service. Okay, So, so the law said the Royal Navy could stop English vessels on the high sea, English, and press, and press crewmen into service. 
technically foreigners, Americans, were, were protected from the press, the impressment. But this was often ignored. So the practice of impressing men at sea became common. And according to the British, you know, all Englishmen were available for service, even if they were on the ship of a foreign nation. So what they would do is pull over, the, you know, uh, board an American ship. And if people didn't have their proper identification, which many of them didn't, they were sailors in the high seas, uh, they would say, well, you, you must be a British subject. So even though it's an American ship, we're taking you off because you're British, even though they weren't. Okay. Uh, okay. So. So it was not uncommon for the British to stop American ships and essentially, you know, in theory anyway, searching for English crewmen uh, and then, you know, grabbing people and, and taking them off the ship. Uh, so if an American sailor could not prove their citizenship, they were often taken off. Well, you must be British then and taken away. OK. OK, so so this war begins and, you know, in this in this war, both sides will suffer. Okay, uh, the 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 White House was was burned down in 1814. So when I say that, you look at the before and after picture here. The on the left, the the White House is in, in purely engulfed in flames, and at the end, it's still standing, the shell, but the inside's completely gone. It com completely collapsed to dust in the middle of the floor. Okay. So what happened is the British raided Washington D.C. very, very uh, out of the blue, kind of, kind of a sneak attack. So uh, President Madison was eating dinner with his wife Dolly Madison and their staff and whoever, uh, just about to sit down to a dinner, when suddenly the front door of the White House is kicked in and it's the British Army here to raid. So Madison and his people ran out the back door to escape, got on horses and rode away, you know, at a gallop to, to escape. So the president was almost captured by the British. A famous moment in this incident is that Dolly Madison takes the time to take a knife and cut the painting of George Washington out of its frame, roll it up and took it with her to save it. Everything else that was in the White House, of course, was destroyed by the fire. OK, uh, even to this day, you can go to the White House and see uh, this is a modern day photo of burn marks on the White House from this event. OK, so this is a big deal. This is like, my gosh, you know, we're we're in trouble now. If they've taken over our capital, the president's on the run. This isn't going to last very long. We're going to lose our colony. OK, um, OK, but for the most part, in the beginning, the British were mostly defensive. OK, because they were still at war with Napoleon, the French in Europe. OK, this was taking place at the same time. The War of 1812 is another world war. And the American portion of it, the United States portion, was a small but significant part of it. But, the, but for the most part, the main, the main push for the British was, were in other places in the world. OK, but after their victory over France in 1814, they were able to send more troops to the United States and to fight the Americans more aggressively. OK. OK. So after the White House incident, uh, the British feeling pretty good about themselves. They decide to let's move on Baltimore, this, this city at the top of the Chesapeake Bay, a very important city of commerce. OK. Uh, so this battle uh, has been made famous by our national anthem. OK. Uh, Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars to the perilous fight, or the ramparts we watch were so gallantly streaming. The rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof to the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say, does that star-spangled banner yet wave, or the land of the free, or the home of the brave? So that, we all know that, right? But, but he's talking about this battle, okay, this battle at Fort McHenry. The British Navy come up the Chesapeake, and and in in front of Baltimore to defend it is the is the uh, fort called Fort McHenry. Okay, and you have this very very famous battle. Okay, um, okay. So how this national anthem come come about? Well, you see you see up here on the left, it's it's written by Francis Scott Key. Okay, Francis Scott Key was an American, and he had been detained by the British, not arrested necessarily, but detained while this battle went on. 
and he was taken out to a ship that was in the harbor bombing the fort. So he was able to, to, to observe it firsthand while he was a detainee on the ship. And as he was watching it, and all through the night, of course, the battle's going on, and, and you think that this, this little fort's gonna, gonna break and be defeated, um, but yet, the, as the night goes on, the, the, stri the stripes and, and stars are still there through the perilous fight. And then it's at one point, towards the, towards the start of, uh, as dawn approached, the American commandant uh, commander took the flag down and put up a huge flag. Okay, so it's very famous for this moment, this huge flag. And that's what Scott Francis Scott Key saw. It's still there. It's, it's still waving after this night and all this bombing. It's still there. Okay, so the national anthem comes out of this this battle. Okay, uh, so let's do this. Let's take another break and watch our our film here, our next film, and this is entitled 1812 War: The Battle at Baltimore. So go ahead and watch that that film and come back. Okay. Okay, um, so the White House is is you know uh, burnt down, not a good thing. Washington is D.C. is looted, but the the Americans, the the, uh, the United States Army or the people of Baltimore, they stop the, the redcoats at Baltimore, at Fort McHenry, and you know on the on on the land approach, and and they're able to to you know, stop that and the British retreat. This is a this is a huge battle. You talk about interesting moments in history. The film talked about one of the cannon shells that, that went up to the the uh gunpowder uh you know uh uh section of the fort where all the gunpowder was stored. It looked like a storage room and the cannonball went right up next to it but didn't explode. It's just one of those moments in history because if it had exploded like it normally would do nine out of ten times, that entire fort would have gone up in 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 a huge explosion, uh, a, a monster explosion would have probably killed all the American men fighting there, and would have given the British a, a, an entry right into the city as their as their land forces coming from the flank, and that would have been all over, and they would have crushed Baltimore. Now they've crushed Washington D.C. Now they've crushed Baltimore, and they take over. And today we're the British States of America again. We're we're back to being a colony again, okay? But like the like the uh, film says, didn't happen. One of those lucky moments. And and of course, many people feel that that this is proof that it's the Christian God that you know ordains the white American people as his favorite, and that's why these things happen, okay? Okay, uh, probably the most famous battle of this War of 1812 is the Battle of New Orleans. Uh, so this is interesting. We, we, we talked about, and when we spoke about the revolution, how long communications could take in a faraway war. So remember I told you that the, that the British in the American Revolution, they had to wait two months before they received their orders. And many times the, the you know, uh, the... Uh, landscape of war would change. By the time they got their orders, they were irrelevant. Okay. So it's the same in this war. So this so the Battle of New Orleans, and here you see on the on the right, this is this is Andrew Jackson, a very famous person that we've spoken about a little bit. Uh very famous person who becomes the hero of the Battle of New Orleans and becomes an American hero and this will lead him to the seventh presidency. Okay. Uh, so a legendary American victory, okay, uh, that included pirates uh, joining the American side under Jean Lafitte, and you know to, to win an unlikely victory. The the British army tremendously outnumbered the American side, uh, but a fog came up and they couldn't see, and and the pirates helped out. And long story short, you have this incredible victory. Yeah, very much a David versus Goliath type of battle, okay? But here's the interesting part, talking about communication taking two months, okay? The the, the Treaty of Ghent, that's G-H-E-N-T, this took place in Belgium, that ended the war was signed on December 24th, 1814. December 24th, Christmas Eve, 1814. But Andrew Jackson, the commander, did not hear about it until two months later. So on January 6th through 
7th and 8th, this battle took place. So, essentially, two weeks after the War of 1812 officially ended with the signing of the Treaty of Ghent, United States General Andrew Jackson achieved what is considered to be the greatest American victory of the war at the Battle of New Orleans, okay? So the war was already over, but nobody knew it. And this is seen as the, you know, the ultimate moment of, of American, you know, victories is this battle. So British casualties in the Battle of New Orleans, 285 killed, 1,265 wounded, 484 captured or missing. So that, that's a whole lot of people. That's 2,000 casualties, almost 300 killed. For the American side, only 13 dead, 30 wounded, and 19 captured or missing. So not very many on the American side, but a fair amount on the British side. And it, and it truly was all for nothing because the war had officially ended, ended on February 7th, 1815, when Congress ratified the treaty. Okay. Um, so well, I'm, I'm sorry. In January, they didn't know that. In February 17, sep, I'll get it. February 17th, 1815, they and they finally, you know, that's when they finally found out and the war was ended. Okay. Okay. An interesting figure that came out of this war is the Shawnee War Chief Tecumseh. Okay. Very interesting guy. Uh, uh, he had witnessed growing up the border warfare that ravaged the Ohio Valley in the late 18th century. He had taken part in a series of raids on Kentucky and Tennessee frontier settlements in the 1780s. Uh, so he, his life, he grew up in war also, okay? He, he then emerged as a prominent Shawnee chief by 1800, the same time that Thomas Jefferson was becoming the third president. In 1805, his brother, Lalawathika, Lala one of his younger brothers, experienced a series of visions and this transformed him into a prominent religious leader so he changed his name to Tenskwatawa or the prophet but, but previously known as Lalawathika okay so prior to this prior to these visions he had been an unassuming man in fact he had not amounted to much uh, but now he became known as a wise man a visionary and Tecumseh saw this as a chance to create a movement and gain some power. So he transformed his brother's religious following into a political movement. Of course, understand that the Native Americans are always scrambling for something. What are we going to do? It doesn't matter who wins again in, this, in, in these wars. I'm talking about the War of 1812 here still. In the end... Whether it's the Americans that win or the British, they're they're going to be against us. They're they're in this very you know between a rock and a hard place. What do we do? So Tecumseh tries to create this 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 you know some somewhat of a, of a political movement to to gain solidarity with other tribes. Okay, so Tenskwatawa means the open door. Uh, the new Shawnee prophet he begins to preach a nativistic revitalization, uh, going back to the old ways. And this seemed to offer the Indians a religious deliverance from their problems. Okay, so this is very similar to what happened at the end of the French and Indian War with, with Pontiac and Pontiac's Rebellion, trying to get the people, to, the Indians to come together, stop fighting amongst ourselves. We got, we got bigger people to fight here. Instead of, instead of uh, squabbling and quarreling, let's come together in solidarity and go ahead and, and, and have a force to, to you know, fight whoever, who, whoever's going to win this war. Whoever does win, we're going to have to fight them, okay? Okay. Um, okay. So 1805, Tecumseh and the prophet, Tenskwatawa, they decide to move their village. They, they move it to the juncture of the Tippecanoe and Wabash Rivers. This is in present-day Indiana, where the new settlement profits down. Was, was started and this this attracted Indians and people people came to, to be to be part of this in, in Prophetstown okay uh, so a, a, as the movement grew and, and got bigger and more people Tecumsa gradually eclipsed his brother Tenskwatawa as the primary leader of the movement uh, and he would travel throughout the Midwest trying to urge tribes to join his confederacy or to form their own, but be allies, all because we have to do something to prevent any further erosion of 
our lands. Okay, we, we've got to stop the white man who keeps on, he's still coming. Okay, it's been a couple hundred years or more, and these people aren't going to go back. They're, they're taking our lives away. We've got to stop them right here, okay? So this is, much like like I said, much like Pontiac, another another attempt by a talented Native American and, you know, a skilled with speaking and, and organizing and, and, you know, leadership, trying to form alliances to fight back against the Americans or the British, whoever wins. Uh, but the truth is, by now, uh, the the natives knew that it's the Americans who are who are our enemy because it's, it's their land now their country the British and this is why many natives ally with the British in this war because it just it's a it's a better choice even though an odd one okay okay so so while Tecumseh was in the south attempting to recruit the the American forces saw their opportunity and they marched against Prophetstown and there's a great battle there. The Battle of Tippecanoe, okay, and um, under the command of William Henry Harrison, who will become the ninth president 30 years later, okay, uh, the army under the command of Harrison defeats the prophet, uh, burned down the settlement, destroyed all the natives' food, uh, it, it burned it all down to the ground, it, it just, just into a rubble, okay. The prophet himself survived, was not killed, but, but the people immediately lost faith in him. If you're the prophet, how did that happen? How, how did these people come and, and annihilate us? Okay. Of course, Tecumseh learns about this and returns, learns of the defeat and is shocked and, you know, forlorn. Oh my gosh, you know, this, all of, all of our, all of our progress is, is over. So he begins to rebuild his shattered confederacy. But, but this war breaks out. The War of 1812 breaks out. And he gets swept up in it. He sides with the British because he hated the Americans, okay? Uh, now, again, it wasn't that long ago that he, that he hated the British. So, again, the Native Americans had a tough time backing any of them. But they always found themselves in a position that they had to choose, okay? So, Tecumseh fought with the British during this 1812 war. Uh, he was there at the capture of Detroit, uh, the British captured Detroit. He led pro-British Indians in actions in southern Michigan, northern Ohio. So, so a player in in this in this war. Okay, uh, Harrison invaded Upper Canada, pushing the British out. Uh, and this this the British are in retreat. Tecumseh reluctantly accompanies the British retreat, and then at the Battle of the Thames. Uh, October 5th, 1813, Tecumseh is killed by American forces in, in this battle, led by William Henry Harrison. So like I mentioned, Harrison became the ninth president later, 30 years later, the oldest person ever elected at that time, 67 years old. Uh, he would become the first president to die in office, only served one and a half months. Okay, we'll talk about him later, but essentially he gets elected. And during his inauguration speech, probably in January, a very cold and, and you know, uh, miserable weather in Washington, D.C. that time of year, he chose to give his inauguration without a hat or a, a overcoat. And he got very wet and cold, got pneumonia, and, and then actually died. So William Henry, Henry Harrison uh, is the person that, that served the shortest term in American history. But back to the 67 years old, the first, the, the oldest person ever elected at that time. Who is the oldest president ever elected in our times? Anybody know? Uh, speak a little louder. I'm kind of far away. Yes, that's correct. Donald Trump, 70 years old when he was elected. The only person ever elected in the history of America, United States, that was 70 or older. Now, Reagan had the record before that. He was 69. So Reagan still holds the record as far as presidents who who serve. Okay, he he was 77 when he left office, so the oldest to serve. But if Donald Trump gets reelected and serves two terms, he will leave the office at 78 and become the oldest to be elected and the oldest to ever serve. Okay, back to Tecumseh. Okay, so he's, he became kind of a folk hero. It's interesting. He was an enemy of America. But seen with with you know uh, 
uh, respect by, by the American people because of his political leadership, oratory, humanitarianism, personal qualities. So he was, he was much admired by both the British and the Americans after his death and even before. So a considerable mythology developed about him, okay? Uh, the famous general for, that fought in the Civil War that we'll learn about towards the end of this class, William Tecumseh Sherman. And of course, his middle name is taken from this man. Uh, so although an enemy of Americans, he became a legend, okay? Okay, we're going to look at a film here. Uh, again, this is called Tecumseh Outdoor Drama. So, so let's uh, get ready to do that. But let me just give you a little bit of background about this film. This is a little bit different than most of the films we've seen, okay? We've talked about popular history before, about dramatizing history to make it more interesting to, to the typical person, okay? So movies, historical fiction, websites, etc., are all out there as a new way to bring history to life, okay? And, and off the dusty bookcases, right? So this film I'm going to show you is about an outdoor play, okay? Um, and it's written by a man named Alan Eckert. Okay, a, a, a pretty famous American author who passed away uh, four or five years ago, but he he's written a number of books, all all about about you know the the America of the of this era, you know from the French Indian War through the War of eighteen twelve, and uh, uh, he's also written a book called Tecumsa, and he wrote a play about Tecumsa. Okay, and this is seen as a you know a, 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 an example of popular history. Where, where you know the the typical person who may not have a interest can come and see a play about Tecumseh and learn the story. Okay, so what what this film is is it's a it's a it's, it it kind of shows you about this outdoor play that's performed entitled Tecumseh, which is performed every year in Chillicothe, Ohio. So every year this play is performed on the actual land that these battles took place with Tecumseh and the Native Americans. Okay. So again, popular history is another example of trying to bring history to the people without presenting it in some in some stuffy fashion or in a boring, unreadable, scholarly fashion. Okay, so go ahead and watch the film Tecumseh Outdoor Drama. Okay, and then come back. Okay, so kind of an interesting, you know, just a little bit of a break here with this with this Tecumseh film, just to show you a, another way that that that. True history and, and you know scholarship type of history, not embellished, not not uh, changed, not not uh, it's it's truth, okay, but shown in a way that becomes more agreeable to to the masses of people, okay. Okay, let's move on here. So let's talk about some politics because who wouldn't want to do that, okay? We talked about the first party system. Uh, Briefly, uh, Jefferson and and uh, uh, and Hamilton. Okay, uh, so the election of 1800 comes along. You got Jefferson versus Adams. Okay, you've got these two different factions, two different parties going on. Okay, and uh, this is this era is, is called the the first party system. We've talked about this briefly. <laughs> Uh, so what what does this mean? The first party system. Well, first of all, understand that this was not what they called it. This is what we've called it from modern times. As as historians, we look back on the entirety of American history, and we 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 use these party systems to periodize. See that word right there, periodize, to help us periodize the political party systems that existed in the United States. Okay. Uh, so the first party system was between 1792 and 1824. Uh, the Federalists controlled the government through the 1790s, and then the Republicans dominated after that. And part, part of that is because Hamilton gets killed in that duel. And we'll see how the Federalists disintegrate as a national party after the War of 1812, okay? So let's look at a, uh, a document here, so stay with me here, um, that I have to kind of give you some more background. And this is that second document I was telling you about before, okay? And I will post both of these. Uh, with the PowerPoints, you have this, okay? So much of this is very similar to what we looked at when we looked at Hamilton versus Jefferson, okay? All, all this here, Hamilton self-made, Jefferson born to well, common people as unable to govern themselves, common people as able to govern themselves. 
So it's very similar, but this this is what the first party system is. The first party system is Hamilton and Jefferson and that start of that dual system. Uh, we will talk in this class about the second party system when we get to it and briefly the third, okay? I'm going to show you all of them here in a, in a minute, but... But anyway, look at this document, please, and uh, you go go through this and understand, you know, what this is. So political parties, of course, we we didn't expect that. What are they? Organizations that mobilize voters on behalf of a common set of interests, concerns, goals. In many countries, political parties play a crucial part in their democratic process. The functions of political parties include formulating political agendas, selecting candidates, conducting election campaigns managing the work of elected representatives, providing the means by which people can have a voice in government. Okay, so please go over this document and learn this. Um, most of this from here down is similar to the other documents. I'm not going to go over that again, but but please just kind of uh, please uh, look through it briefly. Okay, okay. And here at the end, and this is this is kind of how this all breaks down. Okay, how the parties become what they are. We ha we've always had the Federalists. And we have the Republicans of, of, of uh, Jefferson or the Anti-Federalists, okay? Uh, the Federalists and a portion of the, of the original Republicans, they start the National Republican Party over here. So the Republican Party, Anti-Federalist Party splits, half, half start the Democratic Republicans and half join the National Republicans and the Federalists join them too. We, we will see how the Federalists are somewhat just fall out of power as, as we'll find out. So the point is you, you end up with two different parties, the National Republicans, the Democratic Republicans. So we're getting we're getting close to how we how we fashion ourselves into what we have today. OK, and essentially this this will remain the, the Democrats to this day. But the National Re Republicans, they will become the Whig Party as they as they fall out of out of uh, favor. They start the Whig Party. And that would then influence the Republican Party. This is where both parties that we have today start from, okay? So that's all part of this document. Uh, please look at this document thoroughly and, and, and know it. You'll be tested on, on this, okay? All right, back to our PowerPoint here. Oops, excuse me. Where was I there? Okay, so here is a list, and this is not something you'll be tested on, but just for those curious... I mentioned the first party system we're talking about, the era of Jefferson and Hamilton. The second party system we'll get to very soon is the era of Andrew Jackson, Henry Clay. The third party system that we won't see the, the uh, through to its entirety, but we'll touch on it. This is where the Republican Party comes into play, and you have Republicans versus Democrats that we still have today. Okay, For, and just just so you know all the rest, the fourth party system. Is, is the is an era of Republican dominance okay the fifth party system is the era of Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal that comes into the 1960s and the sixth party system which we're still still part of today uh, 1960s to the present is mostly known for the Reagan coalition okay uh, and that of course all, all, all of that from the fourth on are, is a uh, the, is the next the, the next half of American history class not not our class okay Okay, so, so understand what these are. This is a way for historians to separate of today, modern historians, to separate different eras in politics, specifically having to do with political parties and which ones were dominant in that era. Of course, what happens is these men come to dominance, but they but they end up, they get old and they die, and they pass on, and, and new people come up, okay? So in in 200 plus years of history, we've only got six uh, systems, okay? Uh, okay. So again, you won't be tested on, on all of those. Okay. Okay. So let's talk about this two party system idea. We've talked about it before, but, uh, let's watch our next film. This is entitled, how did the U S end up with a two party system? And so this film will give you a little background uh, to this somewhat confusing subject. Uh, and it also gives us a modern day perspective on it. Okay, so go ahead and watch that film, How the U.S. End Up with the Two Party System, and then um, come back here and we'll and we'll keep going. Okay. Okay, so the first party system, 1792, 1824, uh, the first eight years of the nation's existence. George Washington provided unifying presence in this era. 
was the first president, served two terms, 1789-1797. And for the most part, the, the parties kind of, you know, the, the factions were, were, were not completely dominant because they were doing it out of respect to him. He didn't like the idea of political parties. But when he retired, the nation quickly split into opposing camps with different ideologies. And, and the two camps uh, soon became known as Federalists and Republicans. Okay, And that's on that, on that diagram that I showed you on that document. So, so opposing camps, opposing and different ideologies, Federalists and Republicans. So these are the nation's two original political parties. Okay. So Jefferson's election to the presidency in 1800 was bolstered by Republican victories in the House of Representatives and the Senate. The Federalists remained powerful enough to obstruct certain Republican uh, measures for about a decade, uh, but they were not strong enough to, pre to prevent the country from going to war against the British in 1812. So the War of 1812 will be the undoing of the Federalist Party, the first party in American history. Uh, they, the, Federalists, the Federalists were vehemently opposed to this war, and their continuing opposition to it, even after it began, severely damaged their viability as a national party. Their reputation was shot, and their national political clout was over, okay? People in those days, war was honorable. You, you, you want to go to war. We're different today. We don't want to go to war, although we always do. But in those days, it was about men go to war to prove their, prove their honor, okay? Uh, so the people turned against the Federalists who were against the war. Uh, okay, Sam, and we already know that the, that the United States survived this war with Britain, War of 1812, winning tremendous victories at Baltimore and New Orleans, okay? So, so the Federalists kind of fall apart. And they're no longer a, a power, okay? So for the next decade, this is the era known as the era of good feelings. Uh, the United States was essentially a one-party nation. So here I've been talking about the start of this two-party system, the dual-party system that we still have today. Now I'm saying it's it's one. Well, only for only for a, a, a decade because there was no other party around that came to power, okay? So the Republicans governed with little opposition, okay? Uh, but in, in back to our, our, our document, soon factions within that party emerged and out of that, uh, you know, came the national Republicans and the democratic Republicans. So those two would eventually morph into the two dominant parties that, that would define the second party era. These, these two come to prominence. Okay. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and wrap it up here for chapter seven. Thank you.